Hi, I'm Victoria from Downtown Boys, and you're watching Punk Rock Aerobics. Woo! Hi. Punk Rock Aerobics is the original DIY workout that we created 20 years ago that will have you pogoing your ass off. I hold a Punk Rock Aerobics class every Tuesday night on Instagram Live and on Zoom, and you can get the link at punkrockaerobics.com. Each week we feature a new artist and a workout to one of their songs. This week we are featuring Victoria from the Downtown Boys and their song Meldito. Guess what? It's time to phone a punk, so let's go to Victoria now. Hi. Thanks so much for doing this interview, Victoria. We're using your song Meldito for our workout. Can you tell us a little bit about that song? Definitely. So it's a really special song. It was, um, it was our second cover song after Lynch, Let's Lynch the Landlord. Um, and it's written by and sang by Jesse Bulbo, who is an amazing singer and musician from Mexico City. And the music video for it is pretty amazing because it's like her and her rock band and they're like playing on like rooftops and all these different places in Mexico City. And there's just like thousands and thousands of people dancing and going crazy like in all of these really cool like industrial parts of Mexico City. So it's a really special video. I think it kind of like if especially if you give in to sort of like what the media tells you about Mexico or Mexican, it kind of breaks all of that, dispels it with this like documentary type footage. Um, and then the song lyrics were also very inspired by like the only other relationship that um, I've been in since since my past one and got dumped from that relationship because it's basically like all about this like dude that kind of like tries to take over and take a lot of space emotional space of someone and they're like a maldito like they use you emotionally and um, physically but never really want to care about you or meet you where you're at or have to deal with like all the bad sides about you so I think it was like really about how toxic masculinity and I think other forms of power like to put um, non-cis hetero pe male people on a pedestal when we're like, when we do something that they like or when we're, you know, when we're conventionally attractive or when we give them something, but then you're so easily dropped into just this pit when they don't want you anymore. And there's like nothing between the pedestal and the pit. Wow, everything you said is just so awesome. I can't believe there are so many levels for you emotionally and politically in that song for you. That's incredible. It was also music-wise, it was one of the first songs where I had to really learn like how to sing um, because the ending part, the gay, 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 that took me so long to learn because it has like an actual like rhythm and I can't just like shout whatever I want. So believe it or not, that was hard for me. And <laughs> I know most people are like, but um, yeah, so it was also good for me to grow as a musician. And I think Joey, who's our guitar player, um, saw all of those aspects as well. And it has a killer part for the saxophone. <laughs> So do you have any um, exercise routine that you're practicing or doing right now? Oh, wow. So this past year, I picked up running. Um, and so I used to swim. Once I started to sing more, uh, in order to keep my lungs up, I would swim a lot. And I lived in Rhode Island. And one of the beautiful things about living in Rhode Island for me was that it, it's this like place where you find all of these gems to kind of make what feels like a pretty mundane lifestyle really special. And going to the Y is something that like a lot of artists in Rhode Island do. Like a lot of the punks have a YMCA membership. It was so special and it definitely built up my lungs. I would only swim for about half an hour before I like got too tired, um, but it was really special. And then, um, and then about a year ago, I got really into running because it's free and I don't have to pay for a gym membership. When I swim, I look like I'm drowning. And when I'm running, it looks like I'm just like, I don't know what I like. Yeah, going and yeah, just kind of going wild. 
but I really like doing that. I run really slowly. Sometimes I think I walk faster than I run, um, but I listen to music and while I'm running and that's been just so special to me. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you, do you have any sort of dietary restrictions or are there any sort of nutritional guidelines that you follow? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I do, so my family, this is like, like all the people in my family have had to experience and have definitely come out the other end really strong, just like a lot of traumatic things. And I think that all of us were, were pretty public about this, like use food as a coping mechanism. And obviously that can be like a lot better than, than other things. And yeah. in my feeling, it's better to cope with something than to repress it. So I'm just glad like we, we have learned to cope. But because of that, like, um, it's definitely been like hard for me because I don't want, I don't want to use food, food as a coping mechanism. And when I was little, I was made fun of a lot for being fat. Like I was called like a dinosaur and the Michelin man and like called really terrible things like throughout my childhood basically. And sure. um, uh, yeah, and like at one point my grandma actually came and like, during school during recess and asked like which kid had been like calling me stuff like every day I'd come home just like really quiet and finally told her and she like politely told her she was like look like stop making fun of her like how would you like it if someone made fun of the way you look you know um but Go that grandma. definitely I know but that definitely made me like pretty weird in high school like I think I dieted a lot and was kind of upset that like I was pretty skinny in high school, but still had all the same sort of self hatred. Yeah. So I was fortunate because by the time I went to college, I realized like, oh, I need to eat things that are healthy that make me feel good about my physical body. I'm pretty like, I love like fruits and vegetables. I eat like a lot of like, like I like olive oil. Like I feel like I douse my food with like olive oil. Um, um, so yeah, I definitely try and eat healthy. Um, I also just want to live for a long time. And I know that, that that's going to impact that. Okay. So um, has your state of being in shape or not ever affected your live performance? Like, for example, if you're sitting in a van all day or you've been drinking a lot or you're like completely exhausted? Huge. Like, it's huge. Um, and at first, I guess I started touring when I was like 24 you know, at first you just have pure adrenaline and you're just kind of like, oh my God. But then after that, it's like, no, like to sustain or anything, I'd always try and like kind of build up like the week before, eat healthy, um, work out, things like that, just to prepare. And then I think like um, the style and structure of Downtown Boys and also this other band, Malportado Kids that I was in, my role in the band was to kind of like keep it like one texture, kind of just like going the entire time and that's just kind of my role um and so because of that I get I need to warm up my voice like I have a little like thing you can get at Walgreens it's like um that has like hot steam coming out of it like humidifier Vix makes it um and I learned about that from Marissa um no Shannon from Shannon and the Clams has one oh. And then um, this woman named Reba from this amazing band called Whore Paint in Rhode Island. Oh yeah, I know Reba. Yeah. She uh, told me all about the Art of Screaming music uh, videos, Art of Screaming videos. And so that taught me some vocal warmups. Um, and that really puts my, puts my head and my voice into a physical space. But then after, like, I need to rest. I need to like collapse and like, drink like uh, I drink one full bottle of water right before we start and then one full bottle right after um and I need so much rest and last year one of the most amazing tours we've ever been on was in Italy and after each show I had to go to sleep like the rest of the band was able to like go around and like go see all these beautiful things and for some reason I was like I need to sleep like that's the only thing so it's definitely a big big thing okay so my last question that i ask everybody because he's a punk rock hero and he's fit or whatever um what's your take on henry rollins um that's a really good question so <laughs> this is so funny okay so basically screeching weasel was like one of the first um 
like bands that I really listened to in college because I had a, a like roommate who's really into them and then like Black Flag obviously is you know kind of like part of this canon um, and so I think that there I think that there's he's a great example of how like unless someone is like you know a bad person and we really need to hold them accountable like you learn to separate like um the art from the person i think if you're like a public facing artist because you realize that like the art the product is just not representative of a whole person and um and it should it we shouldn't put that expectation on art to tell you everything about the person that made it and i think that he's kind of this thing where i can appreciate some of the um you know like some of the stuff like um black flag and 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 some of the actual like works of art but i do think that at this point of time at this point in time we just like really need to think about what henry rollins has done in terms of bringing like mass toxic masculinity into music especially into rock and roll and um and think about the privilege that he has that like just a lot of us don't have and I think there's always this toss up of him being like a sellout or a legend. But for me, I think it's really a question of like, you know, privilege and entitlement and how he gets to be the debate of sellout or legend. Whereas I think of, a, if, I think that uh, if, a, if I acted the same way or a lot of people that didn't look like him and sound like him acted like that, we would just be, the public court would come out. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. So yeah, I think, you know, I think he as an individual, I think we could go into, and then I think he's just very representative of this like bigger power dynamic. Thanks so much for this interview, Victoria, and for your insightful and thoughtful answers to like every question I had. Um, I really hope I see you soon, either in the Zoom or at one of your live performances soon. Definitely, that sounds awesome. Take care. Thanks, you too. That was an awesome interview. Thank you, Victoria, from the Downtown Boys. Stay tuned for another edition of my Punk Rock Aerobics Phone a Punk series. But until then, I will see you at the class Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Facebook, no, Instagram Live and Zoom. And we'll work out to the Downtown Boys, Maldito. Never mind the buttocks. See you there, punk. Bye.